Hey everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I know it's a super busy week for everybody, so we appreciate everyone being here. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker for this week is Malin Pinsky. Malin is an associate professor at Rutgers University, which is in New Jersey, in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources. He is also a member of the Institute of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, and an affiliate in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. Dr. Pinsky's research focuses on global change ecology and evolution, particularly the consequences of climate change for biodiversity, the genomics of evolutionary rescue, and the implications for conservation design. Malin's interest in the natural world was fostered by growing up in coastal Maine, where he spent time exploring tide pools and other ecosystems. Uh, Malin left Maine to obtain an undergraduate degree in biology and environmental science from Williams College in Massachusetts. He then continued on to obtain a PhD in biology from Stanford. And since obtaining his PhD, Dr. Pinsky has been honored with many awards, including being named an Earth Leadership Fellow, an Early Career Fellow in ESA, an Alfred Sloan Fellow in Ocean Sciences. And most recently, he was honored by AAAS for his significant contributions to the field of marine biology. Finally, Science News listed Malin as one of the top 10 rising scientists to watch um, so be watching him. <laughs> watch him very intently. Um, but so with that, please watch Malin. <laughs> thanks so much, Trish. And thanks everyone for the invitation to be out here, especially Ray Pedlovich for being my host so far. Um, it's really an honor to be here. And also very exciting for me personally to see some snow that I hear that folks around here may be a little sick of it now. We don't get enough of it in. In New Jersey. It's also wonderful to meet new colleagues, reconnect with old friends. I'm looking forward to meeting many more of you over the next day and a half that I'm that I'm here. So by way of introduction, I do focus on global change biology, trying to understand how and why biodiversity changes. And I've trained in quantitative ecology and population genomics. And throughout my career, I've focused on ecological and evolutionary questions at the intersection of landscapes and population and community dynamics. Much of my research has been in marine ecosystems, though not all of it. I hear this happen sometimes, and I just need to wait. And, uh, but it's also, you know, with that, that in mind, it's wonderful to imagine us being at the, the, in the depths of an ancient inland sea here in what otherwise feels like a relatively dry environment. So, Part of Ray's invitation to come here was to spend some time thinking a little bit more broadly than the typical academic talk that I give. So I actually want to talk a bit about my vision for climate change biology as both a basic and an applied science, uh, some outlines of where I see that field needing to go, and especially the argument that I think we need to integrate and do a better job integrating across some of our intellectual silos that we sort of naturally seem to get into. We do live in this time of rapid biodiversity change, new species appearing in places we haven't seen them, disappearing from places they've been historically, changing ecosystem function and phenology, uh, species going extinct as well, evolutionary hybridization and, and uh, new species appearing from that perspective. And is a modern problem in the way that it's driven by human activity. And therefore that sets up important questions about what kind of future we want to help create. But from the perspective of understanding how biological systems work, it's actually a very basic science question. Global and local climates have substantial variability in them over the periods of decades, centuries, or even thousands of years and millennia. This particular figure is just showing climate variability, temperature variability globally over the last 750,000 years. So modern warming is very rapid in comparison to that and increasing quickly. But from the perspective of a monkey flower or a cutthroat trout or a lobster, this is just qualitatively very similar to other kinds of environmental change that these species cope with and adapt to. The rates may be quantitatively different. There are quantitative differences, but it's interesting to think about how this is a fundamental and basic science question to connect these two rates of change and types of change. One side, rapid environmental change, and on the other side, 
rapid biological change, including the feedbacks between the two of them. And yet much of ecological science is focused on equilibrium states, maybe carrying capacity or maximum sustainable yield. Even though we know that ecological systems rarely actually reach those equilibrium states. So I think we need a renewed focus on the dynamics of ecological systems so we can understand how, when, where, and why environmental change drives biological change and vice versa. So I guess put another way, you know, in what ways do ecological systems adapt to environmental change? So we could call this potentially a field of adaptation ecology, understanding how living systems respond to environmental change and changing environments. And the goal would be a mechanistic understanding across biological scales, from genes to individuals to populations up to communities. And this is intentionally a hierarchical perspective with levels nested within broader scales. Because ecological systems don't adapt in just one way. It's not just evolutionary adaptation that's, that's important. And a complex systems, complex adaptive systems perspective is helpful, you know, with many interacting components and then with feedbacks across these scales as well. Because it's not just sort of rates of causality running up in scale, but also running down. We have uh, evolutionary change affecting communities, but also species interactions affecting the dynamics of alleles. So community change and species interactions build from the dynamics of populations across time and space. And those de determine in, in turn the dynamics of communities and the composition of communities. Those in turn are made up of individuals with behavior and physiological requirements that drive population dynamics across space and time, which in turn are shaped by their genetic makeup. So we need theory and frameworks to relate our observations at particular biological scales to the dynamics at other scales, realizing that uh, general rules are likely to be scale specific and will often appear despite unpredictable dynamics at, at other scales. Just as one example, the outcomes of evolutionary change may be relatively predictable, even though the dynamics of individual alleles may not be. Similarly, changing traits within communities or the function of ecological functioning of ecological communities may be relatively predictable, even if the specifics of species identities are actually not that predictable. It's actually one of the important lessons from studies of complex adaptive systems. So some of the overarching questions, some of the overarching questions include how we predict which ecological systems are most adaptable, which are not. What scales are most important for the adaptation and change in ecological systems? And also the important applied questions of how we adapt our conservation and management to the unavoidable aspects of environmental change and biological change. It's something my research group has worked on quite a bit, though. I won't talk about it a whole lot in today's talk in particular. I'm happy to talk about it later. So thinking across these biological scales naturally translates as well to thinking about climate change biology and how ecological systems adapt to climate variability and change from adaptive evolution to behavioral thermoregulation, physiological tolerance and plasticity, Populations can respond by expanding range edges or contracting range edges, and that leads to turnover in species composition, change in community productivity. And it's this hierarchical, that sets up what I think is an important hierarchical challenge within climate change biology to, integrating, to integrate across and among these biological scales. So thinking think across biological scales also requires integrating across a diverse set of research approaches. Many of you in the, in the audience may be experts in particular approaches here, everything from physiological observations to field experiments to quantitative ecology with big data, population genomics, as well as a really important mathematical theory to help us set expectations and to integrate across the gaps where we can't observe or experiment effectively. <laughs> 
As well, as we think about generalizable theory across biological scales, I think it's also really helpful to recognize the incredibly wide range of physical environments that species inhabit on, on Earth. And there are some really interesting contrasts between marine, terrestrial, and freshwater realms. It provides a fascinating opportunity to test ecological theory, and also really important for understanding what aspects and what responses to climate change are generalizable across realms and globally. And yet each of us tends to focus on, you know, marine ecology or limnology or plant biology or the many other silos we tend to put ourselves in. Uh, we tend to go to different conferences, publish in different journals, respond to different funding calls. And I think fostering dialogue and integrating across these silos is really important for scientific progress, for sparking creativity, and also for generalizing beyond one-off examples and case studies. So as we think about different realms, one of the basic differences between marine and aquatic are just the fluid in which species exist. The specific heat of water is about four times higher than, than air. That dampens thermal variability. There's more thermal in inertia. The ocean is also very big, you know, roughly 1.3 sextillion liters. So thermal variability in particular tends to be dampened in, in the ocean. One consequence is that uh, temperatures on land, surface temperatures on land have gone up about a degree and a half Celsius, and they've only gone up about three quarters of a degree at the ocean, ocean surface. On the other hand, that relatively smaller amount of ocean warming is actually quite a lot relative to the historical temperature variability that many of these species experience. This particular plot shows seasonality, so just the standard deviation of monthly average temperatures. Uh, on land is the green line, the ocean is the, is the blue line, and this is across latitudes from southern hemisphere to the equator to the northern hemisphere. There's some interesting qualitatively different patterns, but overall, we have six times less variability in the ocean than on, on land. There's also less spatial variation in the ocean than on, on land. Freshwater ecosystems, probably somewhere in between, um, and re relates in part to the thermal conductivity of water. It's 23 times higher than air. Air is also uh, much more thermally transparent than water. And one of the consequences is that it's relatively easy for an organism on land to move into the sun or into the shade and intentionally modulate its body temperature through behavioral thermoregulation. There are fewer opportunities for that, especially in the ocean. You will notice I'm talking primarily about temperature, and that's in part because temperature has such fundamental biological impacts from metab metabolism to biochemistry all the way up to species interactions. But it's also, more, it's also much more straightforward to generalize across realms in talking about temperature. Precipitation, quite important on land. Oxygen, very important in the ocean as well but uh, harder to generalize those as much. The dimensionality of these systems are also different in interesting ways, you know, largely constrained to the surface, sort of a two-dimensional kind of movement on land, dendritic uh, in freshwater systems, but really three-dimensional for many marine species with movements up and down the water column also being, being important. In addition to those sort of uh, dimensional constraints, there's also uh, differences in how species can move through these environments. And I actually wanna ask all of you a question. So please raise your hand if you find it easier to swim than to run. Who would rather go swimming than go for a run? Someone? Yes, good. <laughs> okay, who would rather run than go, go swimming? I fall in that category too, despite uh, valiantly trying to be on my high school swim team. But for species that have evolved in these environments, it's actually the opposite. It actually takes eight times more energy to run a given distance than to swim that distance. A lot of that has to do with the buoyancy provided by, by water. Just as a note, I'll put citations to others' work over there on the right and to projects I've been involved in on, on your left. So the timeline of human impacts is also different in interesting ways between marine and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, many species extinctions and declines are driven on land 
initially by direct human harvest, but now much more by habitat loss and transformation. Marine ecosystems are much further behind. Commercial harvesting of whales really started about 200 years ago, industrialized commercial fishing uh, as sort of a mid 20th century innovation. And habitat transformation in the ocean is still relatively localized, though expanding quite rapidly now. So these differences across realms raise important questions. You know, how do species respond to climate change and variability? Are those responses similar across realms? Do they occur at similar scales of biological organization? And intentionally, unless we intentionally think and work across these silos to integrate our knowledge, I think we're left without really general understanding of the biodiversity impacts of climate change and variability. So this sets the stage for what I'd like to talk about today. I uh, give you some vignettes and some of the initial insights from work at the level of individual sensitivity to warming, how populations are responding to climate variability and change, and some initial insights into some of the community responses as well. So when thinking about the performance of an individual, it's helpful to uh, think about a thermal performance curve. It's particularly for, relevant for ectotherms. We have the minimum temperature a species can tolerate, a maximum temperature. And then thermal safety is a, is a metric of how much more warming uh, an individual can tolerate. And it's the difference between the body temperature a species experiences and the upper temperature that it, that it can tolerate. And this provides a useful, at least first cut for starting to compare among marine and terrestrial ecosystems. One of the first steps, therefore, is just to compare these upper thermal limits. And it'd be very difficult to go out and measure uh, thermal limits for all species on Earth. So in this particular project, we're standing on the shoulders of the thousands of physiologists who've come before. And I uh, integrated upper thermal limit measurements from experimental studies. So these are a combination of what are called critical thermal limits, so the temperature at which organisms lose equilibria and lose, uh, lose mobility in many cases, or lethal limits, the temperature at which half the population dies. To make the experiments uh, and these measurements more comparable, we focus in particular on adult life stages. And we also account for the temperatures at which uh, organisms have organisms have been acclimated in each of these experiments with what's called an acclimation offset. Since when organisms are acclimated to higher temperatures, we tend to measure higher thermal tolerance limits as, as well. Other factors like study duration and the ramping rate can also be important, but tend to play a relatively small role in these kinds of macro physiological comparisons. So this graph, each of the black dots is a measurement of an upper thermal limit for an ectotherm on land plotted across latitudes. And then the, the gray smooth line is from a generalized additive mixed effects model that accounts for some of the differences among, uh, among experimental methods, but also for the phylogenetic non-independence among some of the species that naturally get included here. You know, it's, there's some wiggles up and down across latitudes, though relatively flat on land. That's actually reasonably different than what we see for marine species, where we see these large drops in upper thermal limits towards higher latitudes. We do have a bit more data towards higher latitudes in, in the ocean as, as well. So that's half the picture of how we can construct a thermal safety margin. The other part is thinking about body temperatures. These are often, uh, for thermal safety margins, folks have often used average uh, environmental temperatures, air or water temperatures. And yet we know that it's usually the extreme hot temperatures that matter the most and that drive the most uh, physiological change or ecological change. So what I'll be showing you, we're focusing on the extreme hot hours uh, in the environments that each of these uh, organisms was, was collected. Calculating body temperatures on land, though, is not entirely straightforward, since we have to think about convection and conduction and solar radiation, as well as the ability of organisms to choose where in the landscape they are during these hottest hours. So the calculations I'll be showing you are from uh, 
a sophisticated microclimate model that's run for a shady location at each place these organisms were collected. It's run hourly for 20 years. And each of those calculations are plotted as the orange dots here. They pair up with each of those, those black dots. And again, the smooth curve uh, across latitudes. You see, actually, there is some parallelism between the extreme high temperatures that organisms experience and the upper thermal limits that species have at each of these locations suggests uh, local adaptation is some component for what we're seeing across latitudes. In the ocean, it's relatively easier because uh, thermal conducti conductivity is so high, ectotherm body temperatures match water temperatures um, quite closely. So we can use water temperatures as an effective proxy for uh, body temperatures. What's less well characterized is behavioral thermoregulation and the ability of marine species to seek cooler and deeper waters during extreme high temperature events. So at least for what I'll show you, we've classified all of the organisms according to their their body size, their mobility, and their habitat, and therefore assumed that they could uh, access temperatures up to 10 degrees cooler depend in the most uh, for the organisms that are the most mobile. So we can show now, so now we've got the two components for thermal safety margins, uh, upper thermal limits and the hot temperatures that these organisms experience across both realms. And it's the difference that provides the thermal safety margins. So then we can plot these across latitudes, thermal safety margin on the y-axis, uh, green for terrestrial, blue for marine. And there are two take-home points that I, I want to point out. One was really unexpected, which was that, the first, well, they were both unexpected, but the first one was uh, that the slimmest thermal safety on land was actually not at the equator, which has been suggested quite widely in the literature, but instead actually at 20 to 30 degrees north and south. So these are where the hottest hours are found on land, relatively lower humidity than the tropics, also lo longer summer days than the tropics. It also suggests that local adaptation to the extent that it's occurring is not fully accounting and able to keep up with those relatively higher uh, extreme temperatures at those latitudes. It also suggests that it's these species and populations at the edges of the tropics that are most sensitive to future warming and not necessarily those right at the equator, which is what's been suggested in the past. The other key to take home message is that across all latitudes, we're seeing slimmer thermal safety for marine species than for terrestrial species. So maybe that suggests that physiologically marine species are more sensitive to future warming. And we can start to summarize some of these different processes in this figure here, where I'm showing you sort of physiological tolerance uh, for climate change and for warming with this relatively larger green circle for terrestrial systems and relatively smaller circle for marine systems. And also more behavioral thermoregulation on land than in the ocean. But the other key process at the level of the individual is plasticity. And in fact, we see we, not research that we've done, but folks like Alex Gunderson and Jonathan Stillman have done suggest that there's more phenotypic plasticity actually for marine species. And that shows up in this figure that they, that they produced where we see change in thermal safety margins across change in mean body temperatures as body temperatures increase. If acclimation was perfect, there'd be no change in safety margins as temperature, temperatures goes up, go up, the species would just acclimate. If there's no plasticity, then it would just be a negative one-to-one -one line. Terrestrial species have some plasticity, but not a whole lot. Marine species tend to have a bit more. So purple and, purple and blue. So we can show that as a larger blue circle here than a, and a smaller uh, green circle for terrestrial systems. We can account, though, for that plasticity, as well as for the uh, relatively faster rates of increase in hot temperatures on land. And yet, despite both of those factors, we still see less thermal safety uh, in the ocean than on land by the end of the century. This is under a, a high greenhouse gas emissions scenario. So at the level of, this, at the, of the individual, it's suggesting that marine species are more sensitive to warming than species on land, and that terrestrial species are doing 
seem to have more capacity for coping at this individual scale. In some ways, that's really surprising. About 15 years ago, there had been very little research on climate impacts on marine species. And yet now it's looking like they may actually be the most sensitive to climate change going forward. I also want to acknowledge though that thermal safety is by far, by uh, not at all the last word on these kinds of questions about physiological sensitivity. Many climate impacts are sub-lethal and uh, that's not well captured by something like a thermal safety margin. So other approaches that are maybe difficult to apply across large number of species, but would be very interesting to think about how to apply them, um, include thermal budget modeling and uh, energy budget modeling and, and other approaches like that. So the processes at the scale of an individual though, don't necessarily mean much for what happens to entire populations. So let's move up a biological scale. And we can think about populations spread across latitudes. They've got a warm range edge and a colder range edge. And many of these processes at an individual scale, as well as a few um, across populations, help uh, these trailing edge populations persist in place, even if conditions change. On the other hand, if physiological tolerance and behavioral thermoregulation and these other processes are not sufficient to cope with change, then we expect this warm range edge to contract towards higher latitudes or contract towards cooler temperatures. So not always towards higher latitudes. So we might hypothesize, given what I just showed you, that contractions are at this warm range edge are more common in marine species. So I want to show you an example from the Northeast US. Is a map of the continental shelf. We've got uh, Nova Scotia and Canada up top, North Carolina down here. This is 1,200 kilometers of uh, continental shelf. And in red, we've got high densities of uh, longhorn sculpin, this very cute species down here. And in blue, uh, places where longhorn scul sculpin were not observed. This is from a scientific survey out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. In this case, in the late 1960s. By, and at that point, the southern range edge in the survey was around Virginia. By 2017, though, that southern range edge had contracted north to New York about 300 kilometers further during a time of rapid warming in this particular ecosystem. To look at more general patterns, we surveyed the literature, pulled out studies uh, that had resurveyed the warm range edges of ectothermic animals. Looking in particular at studies that uh, looked at multiple species and reported results, including for those that did not uh, contract their range edge to avoid publication biases, or at least help avoid publication biases. So going ac looking across 800 papers, we found data for 100 marine species, half of which had contracted towards higher latitudes. For terrestrial species, only a quarter had. So a significantly smaller proportion. One of our questions though, is whether it's just because marine species maybe are harder to detect. So we also trimmed this data down to the 67 marine species with relatively low adult mobility, relatively easier to survey. And yet we still see high fractions of rain, warm range edges contracting towards higher latitudes, suggesting that population extirpations are an important part of what we're, what's being observed, not just uh, mobility and difficult, difficulty detecting. So this combines along with other evidence to suggest that across all of these processes that allow trailing edge persistence, we're seeing relatively more persistence in terrestrial species and actually relatively less in marine systems. But what does that actually mean for species survival? Now, reading the literature, you might think from some, some things that have been published that all that matters is the ability to persist in place and that the most vulnerable species to climate change are those that cannot persist in place. But I think that really misses half of the story because the other key mechanism of persistence is by expanding into newly suitable territories that may be found somewhere else. And that's through dispersal and population growth across latitudinal gradients or elevational gradients, depth gradients, other environmental gradients. 
So answering questions though about range contractions and expansions uh, requires observations across large spatial and temporal scales. That's relatively difficult. We generally have more observations on land and citizen science programs on land have really been an important part of filling in many of the data gaps in recent years through programs like eBird or iNaturalist. But observations from the ocean have been substantially less available. And that's not necessarily, it turns out, because there are fewer observations in the ocean. Uh, actually, governments and related agencies regularly conduct scientific surveys, especially in continental shelf ecosystems. So relatively close to shore, uh, highest species richness, uh, very productive, very important for our, our fisheries. Many of these surveys go back a half century, sometimes even more, really an incredible record of biodiversity change and species distribution change uh, over uh, the last few decades in the ocean. But these surveys actually haven't been readily access accessible. They're often uh, buried within management agencies, uh, stuck in file drawers, stuck on various computers or other databases. So we've pulled together a global collaboration we're calling Fish Globe to make these uh, data sets more intercomparable and more accessible for research and for uh, inter-ecosystem comparisons for management purposes as, as well. Each of the regions for which uh, data are available um, are shown uh, with these colored polygons here. And they contain records literally for billions of organisms. And a lot of this effort has really been led by Aurore Moreau, who's uh, currently a postdoc uh, in our group right now. The first data paper from this effort is also in review and revision right now. We serve the North American portion of these data through our website we call Ocean Adapt, that includes both the US and Canada. And the US portion are also served through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's distribution and mapping tool. Both of these also include animated maps, which we found are really effective tools for engaging uh, students, but also the broader public and journalists and communicating about the kinds of changes that are being observed in ocean ecosystems. These surveys also provide a fantastic record for how species range edges have changed through time. So I just want to show you some work that was led by Alexa Fredston. She was a postdoc in the group now, actually new faculty at University of California, Santa Cruz. And in this, in particular, uh, Alexa looked across 43 species of fishes in the Northeast U.S. And as I mentioned, this is a part of the world that's seen rapid warming over the last few decades. And this is a diagram that compresses a lot of uh, information into a very compact visual communication. It's called a Hovmuller diagram. So I want to explain what you're looking at here. We've got year across the x-axis from 1968 to 2016. And we've got latitudinal bands on this vertical axis from North Carolina up to Maine. The colors, as you can see, are degrees Celsius for sea surface temperature, colder up north, but also uh, has gotten warmer through time. And then what's interesting are these black lines, which are the latitude of different isotherms. So a line of equal temperature. So we've got the 18 degree isotherm down here, and you can see how it's shifted north more than a degree of latitude. And we see similar changes for uh, the 10 degree isotherm up north as well. And then we can compare how far species range edges have shifted relative to the isotherm that they were initially associated with. And what, we, what Alexa found was that the uh, leading or cold range edges were expanding quite a bit faster than the trailing edges were contracting. So actually shifts in distribution are working quite effectively for many marine species. In fact, some are even expanding more than they're, than they're contracting. And not only are they shifting distributions, in this particular case, we were looking at shifts north, but another point I just want to make briefly is that shifts are happening in many different directions. This is just from some earlier work we did looking at the Gulf of Alaska. This is uh, Harlequin rockfish. The dot is showing the center of the Harlequin rockfish distribution in 1984. The head of the arrow is uh, the center in 2011. So 700 kilometers in 27 years. Over that same period of time, though, spiny dogfish barely shifted at all. 
If we look across the range of demersal fish and invertebrates for which there are data in this particular scientific survey, we see an incredible variety of shifts. You can zoom out to North America, look at, uh, in this case, all of the colored arrows are individual taxa, but now I've added these black arrows for the averages across taxa within each region. Again, we see an incredible variety across, across regions and across taxa. Uh, a decent amount of this variation is explained by uh, differences in the direction and rate at which isotherms are shifting in these different, different regions. But there's still a lot of unexplained variation. And now actually part of a really interesting uh, working group called BioShifts uh, hosted at CESAB, the French Ecological Synthesis Center, to understand not just for marine systems, but marine terrestrial and freshwater systems, how much of the variation in rates of rain shift is relate are related to uh, different rates of environmental change versus different traits of the species that are shifting and their ability to keep up with rates of environmental change. The other approach we're taking is actually testing our mechanistic understanding of why species ranges are shifting by forecasting and then testing whether those forecasts are actually uh, effective at predicting what species are doing. The approach we're taking is uh, based on spatial population models. These are coded up as Bayesian hierarchical models, and they uh, include uh, recruitment and mortality as well as dispersal between, between patches. We can then make forecasts into years that we haven't used for fitting. We use a retrospective forecast, so we can actually then compare against observations, but that like I said, we're not used for fitting. At least for some of the very initial forecasts that we've, that we've produced for summer flounder, an important fishery species in the Northeast US, the forecasts are doing reasonably, seem to have reasonable skill at projecting uh, at least the center of species ranges. In this case, the forecast is in black, the uncertainty is in blue, and then the observations from the scientific surveys are in, are in red. We're now in the process of com comparing these relatively sophisticated forecasts against simpler methods to see if they actually outperform the simpler methods. So I think overall, one of the things we've learned is that marine populations respond rapidly to temperature changes by moving across space, both range expansions and range contractions. And there's a, quite a contrast to what we're seeing from research on land where many species are actually persisting quite well in places they've been historically, but are not necessarily expanding that well into new habitats, or at least expanding that quickly. So this brings us up to the scale of community change and efforts to understand whether responses at this biological scale differ across realms as well. One of the really interesting findings over the last, last decade uh, in understanding changes in community composition is that most of the observations that we have of changes in community composition are about replacement of species rather than species gain or loss from particular ecosystems. So that sets up an interesting question about to what extent are these species replacements related to changing temperatures that these communities are inhabiting and therefore changing the environmental filter that's helping assemble these local communities. So to start to get at that question, we looked at Biotime. It's the largest database of community composition time series. The locations of these time series are shown on this map. It's a full range of latitudes and, and longitudes, so definitely concentrated in North America, Europe, and Oceania. We have data from about 40,000 time series across marine, terrestrial, and freshwater realms. Data cover a wide range of organisms, though birds are very well represented on land, fish are quite well represented in the ocean, as you might expect. So from these data, uh, we can then calculate the rate of species replacement through time. Sometimes that's called uh, temporal turnover of species composition. That's what I'm showing you. I will show you here on the, on the y-axis across rates of temperature change on the x-axis here from either warming or cooling or faster temporal turnover higher on this, on this figure. 
So we found our faster rates of turnover in places that are changing temperature faster. The dots here are the time series. They're scaled to the duration of the time series, larger for longer duration time series. And the black line is the best fit from a generalized linear mixed effects model that's actually fit to the raw dissimilarities between times with beta errors. And there's a lot of unexplained variation in here, as you might expect, expect from such heterogeneous data sets. On the other hand, in places with stable temperatures, we see very little turnover. In places that are changing temperature the fastest, we see turnover rates of about 60% of species per decade. Quite a bit. It's also really interesting to see how symmetrical these responses are, even though actually the warming and cooling responses have been estimated completely independently. A lot of the research in climate change biology is focused on warming, but this is suggesting that the effects of cooling are just as dramatic when it comes to community composi composition. We want to do a statistical test. We could use Ekaike's information criterion to compare among different models. Lower AIC values are better, and it does suggest that including the temperature trend is important for terrestrial ecosystems. That's what I'm showing you right here. So this is on land. Like I said, you know, cooling seems to have large effects. Is cooling that common? And as we start to move towards thinking about marine eco ecosystems, I'll just show you a map of sea surface temperatures from a decade taken from the mid 2000s to the mid 2010s. It's just particularly nice because it captures this decadal, decadal pattern. And you'll see in blue, large fractions of the earth experience cooling over any given decade. Despite the long-term global warming trend, variability is important in terms of what species actually experience, what communities actually experience at a local scale. It's very similar if you look at terrestrial temperatures. We then though, go and look at how marine community composition is changing. We see it depends not just on the rate of temperature change, but also on the baseline temperatures. So in communities inhabiting baseline warmer temperatures, we do see faster turnover in places that are warming or in places that are cooling. But in baseline cooler locations, we actually see very little response to temperature change in the ocean. Again, that interaction between temperature change and baseline temperature does seem quite important, very low AIC values when that's included in a statistical model. So why might this be happening in the ocean? That's an interesting question, but I can throw out at least a couple ideas. One explanation would be what has at times been called Janssen's rule. And it's the observation that at high temperatures, species tend to inhabit relatively narrow range of, of temperatures. They have narrow realized thermal niches. So if you move, if you warm or cool, you'll cross a number of thermal niches if you start from high temperatures. Whereas if you start from low temperatures, you'll cross fewer thermal niches. Another contributing factor may be the relationship between temperature and lifespan, shorter at higher, higher temperatures. Like that has to do with the metabolic uh, impact, uh, impacts of temperature on metabolic rates. But that means that individuals turn over faster at higher temperatures and therefore populations and sets the potential for turnover of species at faster rates at higher temperatures as, as well. So to summarize, despite these different responses across realms at the individual or the population level, we're actually seeing quite similar responses uh, across realms in terms of the rates of community composition change. Uh, maybe some geographic differences, especially in the ocean. Changes in community composition are important because they help set the functioning of uh, these ecosystems as well as the contributions of these communities to, to people. So overall, you know, what I've been talking about today, I, I see as sort of small steps towards trying to integrate across biological scales and across, uh, across realms uh, to provide a more global perspective to climate change biology and to help understand how these responses generalize. And I think one of the striking findings so far is just that the dominant biological responses and the scale of those biological responses seem to differ in important ways between these realms.
with these individual scale responses being especially important on land. That's something I showed you through this microclimate modeling and the synthesis of uh, macrophysiological data. Whereas these population scale responses appear especially important in the ocean with range contractions and range expansions being a key mechanism of response to climate change and climate variability. That was data I showed you. That was, those were results I showed you through uh, large scale data, big data analyses uh, from observational data sets. That those kinds of range shifts work well, seem to work, be working well for marine species, but have limits, you know, especially when you think about uh, species that are already at high latitudes and have run out of further locations that they can, they can move to. What this means for species survival then is also, I think, a really important and interesting question. And the realm that I talked the least about today, freshwater, may, at least we conjecture in a recent review paper, may actually be the most at risk of extinction from, from climate change with you know, relatively lower abilities to persist in place and relatively lower abilities to expand into, into new habitats. I think diving deeper into that question would be, would be really interesting. So more generally, I'd argue that we need these diverse methodological approaches because biodiversity change results from processes across each of these scales. We'd actually miss important biodiversity change if we just focused on one particular scale rather than trying to, trying to integrate. And that's in part because different processes are driving change and allowing adaptation across different realms. And I think that's also really important if we're going to provide advice for conservation and for management. So if we don't understand the key processes, then we can't understand how human activities can govern the direction in which these ecosystems continue to change or not. So one final question is, you know, how do we continue this process of integration across, across realms and sort of the intellectual silos that we tend to find ourselves in? You know, a, a few key Key pieces to help that can be funding that explicitly encourages integration across regions, across realms, across, across taxa, or conferences that actively try to do that. There's a Species on the Move conference in May that is trying to that actively is trying to balance marine and terrestrial and freshwater perspectives. Uh, the International Biogeography Society meetings do that reasonably well. But I think it also has to do with the way we do student training. So including more natural history field courses across different realms, marine, terrestrial, and freshwater. And also you know, adding in a value for breadth of training, not just rapid specialization in particular systems. So with that, many people to thank, especially all of you for listening. Wonderful set of colleagues, the students and the postdocs that really make all of this work so incredibly rewarding and fun, and the funders that have supported our work over the years. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>